Action Bureau's field uh, public meeting of its Consumer Advisory Board, or CAB. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is an independent federal agency whose mission is to help consumer finance work by making rules more effective, by consistently and fairly enforcing those rules, and by empowering consumers to take more control over their economic lives. As part of the Bureau's mission to protect consumers, to date we have handled over 1 million complaints and our actions have resulted in nearly 12 billion in relief to more than 29 million consumers. My name is Dixon Martinez. I'm the Associate Director for the External Affairs Division at the Consumer Bureau. Today's meeting is being held at the Consumer Bureau's headquarters in Washington, D.C. This is the CAB's second meeting of the year, and as always, we have a packed schedule. Today's meeting is being live streamed at consumerfinance.gov, and a recording will be made available on the same website. You can also follow CFPB on Facebook and Twitter. Let me spend just a few minutes telling you what you can expect at today's meeting. First, I'll introduce the CAB members, then the Consumer Bureau's Director Richard Cordray will provide opening remarks. Following the director's remarks, Ken Brevort, Section Chief for Credit Information and Policy in the Bureau's Office of Research, will engage the CAB in a discussion about credit visibility. Then at 11.20 a.m., the CAB will hear from Will Wade Gary and Wei Zhang respectively the Assistant Director and the Credit Card Program Manager for the Bureau's Office of Card, Payment, and Deposit Markets. The two will lead a discussion about deferred interest products. After that discussion, the CAB will adjourn at approximately 12 p.m. At 2 p.m., the CAB's Chair, Mava Lee Brown, will resume the meeting. CAB members Paulina Gonzalez and Lynn Drysdale will lead a discussion about trends and themes in the field. Following that discussion, the CAB will hear from Grady Hedgespith and Alan Ellison, respectively the Assistant Director and the Small Business Program Manager for the Bureau's Office of Small Business Lending. They will lead a discussion about the Bureau's recent request for information about small business lending. The meeting will then adjourn at approximately 4.30 p.m. As many of you know, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, which created the CFPB, also provided for the establishment of a consumer advisory board to advise and consult with the CFPB in the exercise of its functions and to provide information on emerging practices in the consumer financial products or services industry including regional trends, concerns, and other relevant information. Today's meeting and discussion is in support of this important statutory responsibility. As a reminder, the views of the CAB are their views and they are greatly appreciated, yet they do not represent the views of the CFPB. So let's get started with an introduction of the CAB members. The chair is Mava Elise Brown. She is the executive director of Housing and Economic Rights Advocates in Oakland, California. The vice chair is Ann Bador. She is the director of the Fair Financial Services Program at Texas Appleseed in Austin, Texas. Seema Agnani is the director of policy and civic engagement at the National Coalition for Asian Pacific American Community Development in Washington, DC. Tim Chen is the CEO of Nerd Wallet in San Francisco, California. Lynn Drysdale is the managing attorney of the Consumer Law Unit at Jacksonville Legal Aid in Jacksonville, Florida. Kathleen Engel is a professor at Suffolk University Law School in Boston, Massachusetts. Judith Fox is a clinical professor of law at the University of Notre Dame in Notre Dame, Indiana. Paulina Gonzalez is the executive director of the California Reinvestment Coalition in San Francisco, California. Julie Guggen is the executive director for the Minnesota Home Ownership Center in St. Paul, Minnesota. Neil Hall is retired, having previously served as the executive vice president and head of retail banking at the PNC Financial Services Group in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 
Brian Hughes is Senior Vice President and Chief Risk Officer at Discover Financial Services in Deerfield, Illinois. Christopher Kukla is the Executive Vice President at the Center for Responsible Lending in Durham, North Carolina. Ruhi Maker is a, senior vice, is a senior attorney at the Empire Justice Center in Rochester, New York. Joanne Needleman is a member at Clark Hills Consumer Financial Services Regulatory and Compliance Group in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Patrick O'Shaughnessy is the president and CEO of Advance America in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Ariane Schutte is the founder and managing partner at Core Innovation Capital in Los Angeles, California. Lisa Servan is a professor of city and regional planning at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Jim Van Dyke is founder and CEO of Futurion in Pleasanton, California. James Wayman is the executive vice president of SCORES at the Fair Isaac Corporation in Roseville, Minnesota. Chi Chi Wu is a staff attorney at the National Consumer Law Center in Boston, Massachusetts. And Joshua Zinner is CEO of the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility in New York, New York. We also have with us Delicia Han, staff director for the Bureau's Office of Advisory Board and Councils. I am now pleased to introduce Richard Cordray. Prior to his current role as the CFPB's first director, he led the CFPB's enforcement office. Before that, he served on the front lines of consumer protection as Ohio's Attorney General. In this role, he recovered more than $2 billion for Ohio's retirees, investors, and business owners, and took major steps to help protect its consumers from fraudulent foreclosures and financial predators. Before serving as Attorney General, he also served as an Ohio State Representative, Ohio Treasurer, and Franklin County Treasurer. Director Cordray. Thank you, Zixta, and welcome to this meeting of the Consumer Advisory Board. Once again, I thank our members for sharing your ex expertise and perspectives on the concerns of consumers and the issues we face at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. You help us maintain our focus, prioritize our work, and fulfill our responsibilities more effectively. We share a belief that consumers deserve fair treatment in a more transparent and competitive financial marketplace. Usually in these remarks, I highlight the work we're doing in one particular area and describe it in some detail. Today, I will do something different. My remarks will touch on several different issues to show more of the breadth of the work that we're doing in various areas simultaneously. For each, I'll identify our goals and describe the progress we're making to achieve them. In particular, I'll discuss four topics. First, I will address our latest efforts to encourage more transparency in the credit card market to reduce risk to consumers, especially those who are the most vulnerable. Second, I will update our groundbreaking research into the phenomenon we have described as credit invisibility by discussing a new report on how consumers become credit visible. Third, I will say more about our recent request for information to help us fulfill our mandate to develop data collection for small business financing. Fourth, I'll describe how we intend to proceed in formulating new rules to govern the debt collection market. Each of these topics reflects our efforts to understand better how to support and protect consumers. On the first topic, we're announcing today that the Consumer Bureau has sent letters to the top retail credit card companies, encouraging them to consider adopting more transparent credit practices. Many retail credit cards offer consumers promotions with deferred interest as a financing option for certain purchases. They promise consumers that they will incur no interest charges for a set period if the promotional balance is paid in full at the end of the period. Our research has led to concern that these promotions may surprise consumers with high retroactive interest charges after the promotional period ends. The Bureau is suggesting instead that companies consider a 0% interest promotion that is more transparent and carries less risk for consumers. Deferred interest financing is commonly offered on store brand credit cards. They may be marketed as an attractive way to buy big ticket items such as appliances, furniture, or even medical or dental services while avoiding interest charges. But they can be confusing for many consumers. Under these plans, customers are generally not charged interest if they make payments on time and pay off the purchase balance within a set time frame, usually six months to a year. 
However, if any balance remains unpaid at the end of that period, consumers can be hit with interest charges that are retroactively accrued from the date of the original purchase on the entire amount of their original promotional balance. This can happen no matter how little remains unpaid and whether or not they've actually paid more than the original balance, which can be the result when they've made other purchases in the meantime. All of this can make these deals confusing and surprisingly costly for consumers. This back-end pricing is less transparent and thus can obscure the costs and risks of entering into the promotion. The problem is compounded if the promotions are marketed in ways that may be questionable or even illegal. This lack of transparency can also hamstring consumers who are trying to manage their finances. In 2015, our consumer credit card market study showed that a large percentage of consumers who fail to repay the balance during the promotional period and thus get hit with all of the retroactive interest will pay off the amount of the remaining principal and related interest charges shortly thereafter. This suggests that many consumers could have completed the terms of the promotion in a timely fashion, which suggests they may have misunderstood how the product works. We saw this again in the monthly complaint report we issued last week, which noted that some older consumers on fixed incomes have expressed confusion about the terms and conditions of deferred interest credit promotions. The Bureau's research has found that deferred interest programs tend to have uneven effects for different categories of consumers, predictably posing the greatest costs and risk for the most vulnerable. Those with low credit scores manage to avoid retroactive interest charges only about half the time. Yet those with high credit scores avoid interest nearly 90% of the time. When other purchases are made on the same card before the original promotion expires, it muddies the waters further. Our 2015 study showed that over half the people with other purchases who were assessed deferred interest actually paid more than their full promotional balance during the promotional period. Over one-third of these consumers paid more than 150% of their promotional balance during that period yet they still suffered the adverse consequences of the retroactive deferred interest charge. The Consumer Bureau has long warned about the pitfalls associated with deferred interest financing, which does not reflect the general shift toward more transparent upfront credit card pricing spurred by the CARD Act of 2009. Its reforms aim to reduce back-end fees and abusive credit card policies. Over the last few years, we've taken legal actions against credit card companies for deceptive marketing of deferred interest financing and certain add-on products that carry risks for consumers. We've imposed penalties, secured relief for those who were harmed, and made clear that such practices can violate the law. Last month, Walmart, one of the nation's largest retailers, in partnership with one of the largest U.S. credit card issuers, announced that it will no longer offer deferred interest promotions on its store credit card. Instead, it will offer a more straightforward 0% interest promotional program. Under this program, interest is not assessed retroactively if the full balance is not repaid at the end of the promotional period. Following the promotional period, the interest rate converts to the regular rate and interest begins to accrue only on remaining balances. These terms are easier for consumers to understand and the costs are more transparent. So we're encouraging others to consider adopting this approach. In the meantime, you can find consumer tips about credit card interest rate promotions on our website at consumerfinance.gov. We have advice on ways to keep interest costs down and how to avoid surprise charges. Consumers who have complaints about credit cards can submit them on our website or by calling us toll-free at 855-411-CFPB. Our second topic returns to the seminal research we've been doing on those who are credit invisible, those with no credit record with a nationwide credit reporting company. The Consumer Bureau estimates that 11% of adults in the United States, or about 26 million people, fall into this category. And we've discussed the obvious consequences. Lenders are hindered because they cannot readily assess the credit worthiness of these potential customers. And consumers can be hindered if they have less or no access to responsible credit, which means less or no access to the opportunities that such credit can create. Having pointed out these undesirable facts, we're now working to understand what can be done to change them for the better. One line of inquiry is to explore how those who start out as credit invisible could become more visible. For all the real challenges consumers face, millions of them every year do establish credit records. In particular, few Americans have any credit record before they turn 18. Yet by age 29, about 90% of Americans are able to become credit visible. So the interesting question is, how do people make this transition? 
A new report we issued yesterday examines the transition to credit visibility, when and how consumers first establish a credit record. Our study found the way consumers establish credit history can differ greatly based on their economic background. People in lower income areas are more likely than people in higher income areas to become credit visible due to negative records, such as a debt in collection. Consumers in higher income areas are more likely to establish credit history by using a credit card or relying on somebody else. Credit cards are the most common way that consumers establish their credit, with roughly 38% of consumers becoming credit visible based on a credit card. Yet our study found this is more likely to be true of consumers in higher income neighborhoods. 44% of them established a credit history with a credit card, versus 34% of consumers in lower income areas. We also found that almost 25% of consumers become credit visible by relying on credit already established by somebody else, such as a family member. About 15% opened a credit account with a co-borrower, and another 10% became an authorized user on someone else's credit card. Again, we see differences based on economic background. About 30% of consumers in higher income neighborhoods turned first to co-borrowers or authorized users, but only 15% of consumers in lower income neighborhoods did so. A third way to become credit visible raises graver concerns. We found that 27% of consumers in lower income neighborhoods first establish a credit record not through their own efforts to seek credit, but instead when various items such as debt collection accounts or public records begin to populate their credit reports. This rate is 240% higher for them than it is for consumers in higher income neighborhoods. And almost all of these credit records, we estimate 90%, reflect uniformly negative information about the person's credit worthiness. This tells us that consumers in lower income neighborhoods often become credit visible in ways that leave their credit records shadowed by unfavorable items right from the start. Another interesting finding is that student loans are becoming a more common means for consumers to establish a credit record. Ten years ago, about 40% of consumers who became credit visible before age 25 did so with a credit card, whereas only 10% did so as a result of a student loan. Today that gap has narrowed considerably. 26% of younger consumers who became credit visible in 2016 did so as the result of a student loan, and 33% did so based on a credit card. This reflects both the increasing importance of student loans in the lives of younger consumers and some reduction in their use of credit cards. This study on credit visibility is helping us learn more about how credit can be expanded to include more consumers so they can better participate in the mainstream financial system. Yet another way to achieve this outcome and another potential route to establish a credit record is through so-called alternative data. This includes payments made on items such as rent or cell phone bills, which may be used to ass assess the credit worthiness of consumers that would otherwise remain credit invisible. We issued a request for information back in February to learn more about how this non-traditional information is used or can be used. The comment period has now closed, and we're digesting what people have told us, and we will have more to say before long. We're also studying the availability of credit to small businesses, which are so vital to the nation's economy and our communities. The primary basis for our interest is the Dodd-Frank Act. In creating the Consumer Bureau, Congress directed us to write a regulation about the collection of information from financial institutions that lend to small businesses. This data is intended to benefit small businesses, creditors, policymakers, and regulators so they can better understand the credit needs of small businesses and the opportunities to meet those needs. There are other reasons why a deeper understanding of small business financing may be quite important to progress in our economy and our quality of life. One 2013 study found that counties with higher percentages of their workforce employed by small businesses showed higher local income, higher employment rates, and lower poverty rates. Small businesses have created an estimated two out of every three jobs since 1993, and they provide work for almost half of all private sector employees. Yet we remain aware of large gaps in the public's understanding of how well the financing and credit needs of America's entrepreneurs are being served. Last month, we issued a request for information to get feedback on how to carry out this task in a careful, thoughtful, and cost-effective way. We're facing a number of difficult questions as we assess how to proceed in this new area. In particular, we're looking at how a small business should be defined for these purposes and what types of information lenders consider when financing them. 
We're looking into where small businesses currently seek credit and what credit is available to them. We're also considering the privacy implications that could arise in publishing this information. The importance of this undertaking could not be clearer. In a white paper, we documented the importance of small businesses to our economy and the critical role that financing plays in enabling these businesses, especially minority and women-owned businesses, to thrive. At a recent field hearing in Los Angeles, we heard compelling reports, reports that in many communities of color and immigrant communities, the most frequent paths to wealth creation are to start a small business and to develop equity in one's home. Obviously, if there are roadblocks that impede lending to such communities, then economic vitality could be severely diminished. So the same mechanisms that have been used for years to diagnose community development needs in the mortgage market and impediments to mortgage lending would now be applied in some fashion to small business lending as well. Our job is to figure out how best to accomplish that, recognizing the clear differences between these two lending markets. The Bureau is also mindful of the potential complexity and cost of small business data collection and reporting. We will explore ways to fulfill this duty in a balanced manner, seeking to provide timely data with the highest potential to meet the statutory objectives while minimizing the burdens for both the industry and the Bureau. We welcome input from a wide range of stakeholders, including lenders and business trade associations. Several of these groups have asked for more time to respond to the request for information. We've also been hearing from congressional officials who want to see more progress made on this rulemaking. We've had a steady plan from the outset to take up this task right after we finished the HMDA rules, and we are now moving forward. We do recognize the importance of quality responses from the public, so the Bureau is granting the request for a 60-day extension to the comment period. The final issue I'll discuss today concerns our efforts to write new common sense rules of the road for the debt collection market. We've already begun taking steps to develop new rules for this industry to protect both consumers and honest businesses. Debt collection is still the single largest source of complaints to the federal government in any area of consumer finance. People cannot vote with their feet if they experience problems because they have no choice over who collects their debts. This makes them less able to protect themselves for harmful practices, which is a classic example of what economists would term a market failure. For these and other reasons discussed below, we're moving forward with the rulemaking process here. In addition to those concerns, there are two other reasons why it would be appropriate to adopt new rules to govern the debt collection industry. Both tend to show how regulation can improve and benefit the marketplace by bringing more order, more clarity, and more transparency to its everyday functions. In the first place, this market is one where the primary governing law is a statute enacted way back in 1977. That law, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, contains broad prohibitions on practices that are, quote, unfair or unconscionable, or acts whose natural consequence is, quote, to harass, oppress, or abuse. Yet until the Consumer Bureau was created, no agency had the authority to define more specifically the scope of these broad prohibitions. As a result, this area of the law has been out, become outmoded over the past 40 years. The courts have been forced to try to make sense of the statutory provisions and apply them to a very different world, leading to a patchwork of inconsistent rulings that breeds disarray and uncertainty. Conflicting rulings from different courts make it difficult for compliance attorneys to give firm guidance to companies that operate in this realm. So writing new regulations in this area makes a great deal of sense. Both industry and consumer groups are pressing for updated interpretations of the law because so much is happening in this marketplace that the law cannot easily keep pace with developments. The 1977 statute mentions telegrams and was written with landline phones and postal mail very much in mind. By contrast, many of today's consumers are adept in using the internet, email, and social media, yet debt collectors are uncertain how to address many issues involving these new technologies. Cell phones were unknown at the time the law was drafted, and the debt buyer industry barely even existed. Although the courts can try to use their tools of statutory construction to retrofit the statutory language in light of these vast changes, the better course is likely to be to reinterpret it based on a frank and thoughtful assessment through a rulemaking process. That process can be informed by industry officials, consumer advocates, and market experts about how to apply the statute to these new and unforeseen circumstances. 
Last summer, we outlined proposals under consideration that would apply to third-party debt collectors and debt buyers. We also announced our intention to move forward with separate rules for first-party creditors who collect on their own accounts. The proposals we outlined focused on three primary issues. First, make sure that collectors are contacting the right consumers for the right amount. Second, make sure that consumers clearly understand the debt collection process and their rights. Third, make sure that consumers are treated with dignity and respect, particularly in their communications with collectors. As we evaluated the feedback we received on the proposals under consideration, one thing became clear. Writing rules to make sure debt collectors have the right information about their debts is best handled by considering solutions from first-party creditors and third-party collectors at the same time. First-party creditors, like banks and other lenders, create the information about the debt, and they may use it to collect the debt themselves. Or they may provide it to companies that collect the debt on their behalf or buy the debt outright. Either way, those actually collecting on the debts need to have the correct and accurate information. All of these parties must work together to ensure they're collecting the right amount of debt from the right consumer. But breaking the different aspects of the informational issues into pieces in two distinct rules was shaping up to be troublesome in various ways. So we've now decided to consolidate all the issues of right consumer, right amount into the separate rule we will be developing for first party creditors, which will now cover these intertwined issues for third party collectors and debt buyers as well. That way we can address this entire set of considerations market wide. In the meantime, we will be able to move forward more quickly with a proposed rule focused on the remaining issues. These issues, again, are information third-party collectors must disclose to people about the debt collection process and their rights as consumers, and ensuring that third-party collectors treat people with the dignity and respect they deserve. Once we proceed with a proposed rule on these issues, we will return to the subject of collecting the right amount from the right consumer, which is a key objective regardless of who is collecting the debt, and we'll take care to get it right. The issues I've just discussed span a considerable spectrum, but at their core they have much in common. They touch on fairness and protection for all consumers, especially those who are underserved or having financial problems. Our mission is to make sure that markets are fair and transparent, that people are treated with dignity and respect, and that every consumer counts. We look forward to hearing from you today in order to better inform our approach to our work. As always, we're giving a great deal of thought to these and other issues, and we welcome your suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Director Cordray. Today's meeting focuses on some very important topics such as credit visibility. And let me back up for a second to say welcome, everybody, in the audience, the audience writ large, online, and in before us today in person. Our meeting today is going to cover topics such as credit vis visibility, as the director mentioned, the costs and risks associated with deferred interest products, and the small business lending market, among other trends and themes in the consumer financial marketplace. The CAB has long followed the Bureau's work on credit and visibility, and as we now transition into examining some of the data explored about consumers who are new to credit, we look forward to learning about consumer con experiences and what we can do to empower and assist consumers. We also look forward to discussing products like deferred interest products, which for many consumers new to credit can be challenging. To start this morning's session, we will hear from Ken Revort, Section Chief in the Bureau's Office of Research on a report that was released just yesterday. Ken. So good morning, everyone. Um, as you just heard, I'll be talking about our report, which came off uh, or was published just yesterday. Uh, it's joint work with my colleague here at the CFPB, Michelle Kambara. Um, and I should have slides that will hopefully be appearing momentarily. Ah, good. I, I once was late getting slides to a, a conference, and I promised the organizer that if I didn't actually get them in on time, I would just do the entire talk through interpretive dance. Um, <laughs> and believe me, no, nobody wanted that. Um, so the, the work I'm going to be talking about today actually starts with, oops. It starts with a, a data point that we issued about two years ago in May of 2015. 
Uh, it was called Credit Invisibles, and it was basically our attempt to come up with a better measure of uh, the number of people who lacked a credit report at one of the three nationwide credit reporting agencies, and a better understanding of exactly who these people are in terms of what their characteristics are, to get a better sense of sort of what efforts may be most fruitful at trying to get these people access to, to credit. Because if you do not have a credit re record at one of the large credit reporting agencies, ultimately you can't have credit scores generated for you generally, um, and it's going to it's going to make uh, obtaining credit all that much more difficult. Now, in that report, one of the things that we did was we came up with a broad estimate of the, the number of people who were credit invisible. Um, and what we want to do in this uh, paper is take another step and look at sort of how people were able to make the transition from being credit invisible to having a credit record. Uh, in the data that we came out with about two years ago, one of the results we found was that if you looked at people who were 25 to 29, 9% of them uh, were credit invisible, meaning that they did not have a credit record at the credit reporting agency that we looked at. Now, if you turn that number around, it means that 91% of people who were 25 to 29 at the time we did that study had managed to get a credit record. Now, no one starts life with a credit record, and very, very few people have a credit record before they turn 18. So what this means is that in this 10-year period between, say, when they turned 18 and when they hit their late 20s, about 90% of the people are able to make this transition from not having a credit record to having one. And we know that there's been a lot of policy interest in the people who are credit invisible, because we all know that there, are, there is difficulty there. If you do not have a credit record, you have a harder time obtaining credit. And so what we wanted to understand is why it is that so many people seem to be able to make this transition while others have had difficulty with it. And we want to understand the types of consumers that are making this transition and the means that they're using to make this transition. So what types of credit products or other information um, are they acquiring their credit history from? And so that's going to be the, the, the topic of the, the research we're going to talk about today. Now we'll start with uh, the data that we're using for this talk. The data come from what, uh, the same data source that we used in our earlier work, and that is our consumer credit panel. Um, this is a large nationally representative sample of de-identified credit records that we obtained from one of the three nationwide credit reporting agencies. Um, the, the records are de-identified, and what I mean by that is that they do not contain any information about name, address, social security number, anything that would directly identify the consumers in this data. So we don't know the, who the consumers are, but we know the contents of their credit records. So we know if they had credit cards, when they were opened, what their balances were, and things like this. And we've been using this, these data for a number of things uh, to inform sort of our general policy and market monitoring missions. Um, and part of it is to better understand what the characteristics of credit reports look like for these consumers who are making these transitions. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the archives that we have from December 2006 to December 16, of two, sorry, December 2016. Um, in the credit records that we have, we do not have date of birth. That's sort of, we, we didn't get that because we thought it was potentially, uh, it, we, we didn't like the idea of having date of birth because it was potentially in, in, impeding the anonymity of the data. But we did get year of birth, so this gives us a chance to look at different ages of consumers. So one of the things we looked at in our early Credit, credit Invisibles report was how the likelihood of being credit, or the incidence of being Credit Invisible, differed by different age bands, right? And Credit Invisibility was much more common amongst the young, much more common amongst the old, uh, and people in, in the, the ages in between, it was much lower. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the credit records from the December of each year, and then we're going to look at sort of how transitions played out across different age groups um, based on what the age of the consumer was at the end of that year. Um, and we're going to look at transitions in specifically, uh, I think, 11 different age groups, starting with consumers who are under 25, 25 to 29, 30 to 34, up by five-year age bands through 65 to 69. Um, and the way we're doing this is in each of the December archives, for each of those age groups, we take, for example, in the 2006 archive, we take everybody who turned 24 uh, in 2006. We then look at their credit record and then we look at how they first became uh, or how they first moved out of credit invisibility. For some reason I don't like the word credit visible but um, I, I probably should start using that more because it's going to make this talk a lot easier. Um, and we did the same thing for, for older ages. So we looked for, we took everyone in 2006 who was 29 and then looked at those people who established their credit record when they were 25 to 29. So a lot of the analysis we're going to be doing is also going to be doing cohort analysis. So when we look at 2006, we talk about people who were under 25 or established their credit record before they were 25 using the 2006 archive. We're really talking about those consumers who were born in 1982. 
when we use that same age group for the 2007 archive, we're going to be talking about consumers who were born in, two, in 1983 and so on and so forth. So we're going to be able to also look at how these transitions out of credit and visibility were playing out differently for pop different populations of consumers, right? So as we moved further and further into the millennial population, how did these transitions play out? Uh, or for the older consumers, we're looking at a, a much uh, different age range. Um, th this table here shows the summary statistics for the data that we're, we're looking at. Overall, we have records uh, for about a little bit over a million people who appear to have made this transition from being credit invisible to having a credit record over the time period of, of our sample. Um, the table of the column at the, the rightmost side shows the birth year cohort ranges, right? So for the under 25 population, we're going to be looking at people who were born between 1982 and 1992. Uh, and the older ages, we're going to be looking at slightly different uh, birth year cohort ranges. Now, one of the things that jumps out at you or, or would, would you just take a moment, Ken, yes. and explain to people that this data is de-identified and anonymized, how, how mm -hmm. that is? Just take a minute for that. Thanks. Yeah, so the, the data are de-identified. We do not have name, address, social security number. We have nothing that would identify the individuals. Um, we don't know where they live in terms of their address. We do have a census tract that we'll, we'll use a little bit to understand sort of uh, what, what the neighborhood that they were growing up in uh, looked like or what the neighborhood they were living in looks like. Uh, but there's nothing that would actually directly identify these consumers in the data. Now, if you look at the, the data in these tables, one of the things that, that jumps out at you, I think, is that if you the share of the population that establishes their credit record or makes this transition um, who are under 25 is, about, I think, about 80% of, of the entire sample. Right? So most of the people who make this transition from being credit invisible to being credit visible seem to do so at a very young age. Right, and that's consistent with the results we published um, in our earlier study, where the, the ratio of, of credit invisibility was much, much higher amongst people who were 18 and 19 or, or younger than that than it was at, at older ages. Um, and this, the sample size actually declines pretty consistently throughout the age groups. So the number of people who we observe making this transition over this period of time uh, goes down as they go higher and higher. Right? So you generally don't see a lot of people who are 65 to 69 um, establishing a credit history. Are you, are you open to questions as you go, yep. or do you want them at the end? Sure. Of those who uh, establish credit history at a later age cohort, would a high percentage of those be immigrants, or would, would do you have a sense of what percentage of those might be immigrants? I, I don't think we have a sense. A, a, a good portion of them may very well be in, immigrants. It also could be people who had a credit record at one point, and then something went wrong, and they stopped acquiring new credit, and the credit they are the credit items that were on their history migrated These are the kind of things you're going to be digging into further, yeah. perhaps? Okay. Yep. All right, and everyone else, if, if you have questions as we go, feel free to interrupt me if I'm not being clear. Okay, so we have these credit records of people um, who went from being credit invisible to visible. And one of the first things we're going to do is we're going to start identifying what it, what item it was that was first reported on their credit record, right? Because this should have been the piece of information that ultimately led to the creation of their credit record. And we're going to characterize that item uh, according to one of six or one of eight different, there should be like little circles, All right? Sorry, the, the bullets aren't, aren't printing. But anyhow, one of eight different uh, types of entry products. Uh, people whose first credit experience or whose first item on their credit record uh, was an automobile lo loan or lease a credit card, a mortgage, a personal loan or some other type of loan, uh, not classified, retail loans, uh, which include department credit score, uh, credit cards, and student loans. So we're going to look at those six types of entry products, all of which are loans that the consumer has applied for uh, and wound up being reported. And then we're going to look at two other pieces of information that are for non-loan activities. And these are collection accounts that are reported by third-party debt collectors, so if the consumer had a cell phone uh, that they didn't pay the bill on, the bill was then sent to a third-party debt collector, and that wound up being reported, it is possible that that reporting of that third-party debt collection was the item that triggered the creation of their credit record. Uh, and so those are, we have collection accounts like that. And then there are other non-loan things that are reported. Uh, in particular, there are public records, could be bankruptcy filings, could be tax liens, uh, could be civil judgments that are reported. There may be utility bills. Uh, that are sometimes reported to the credit bureaus that could lead to the triggering uh, of one of these uh, credit records. Uh, the utility bills can actually be either bills that are being paid on time, but they are very frequently uh, bills that are reported once they've become delinquent. And there's even some reporting of child support and family support payments in there as well. 
And so for each consumer who makes this transition out of credit invisibility, we identify the product, uh, what we're calling the entry product, or the item that was first reported that led to the creation of their credit record. Um, and I should point out that the way we're defining uh, credit invisibility here is, is very narrow. And we're doing it using the same definition that we used in our, our previous study. And it's just the question of, did this person have a credit record or not? Now, I, that's narrow. Can, can I note something here? Yes. Uh, this is something we remark upon from time to time and, and think about and uh, aren't always sure what to make of it. But if you look at the first six categories there, they're all loans that yep. the consumer would take out. Mm -hmm. And therefore, positive data about their performance on the loans would be fed into the credit reporting system mm -hmm. over time. Presumably, negative information would as well if yep. they fail to make a payment. But a lot of those things will then show up as collection accounts. So negative information will feed in that way mm -hmm. on loans, right? The last category is kind of unique, the other non-loans, because in those areas, uniquely, only negative data will tend to feed onto your credit report. So it's kind of a one-way ratchet that has always felt to us somewhat unfair. So in terms of utility bills, child support payments, and other things, a long history of making these payments, rent would be in this category too, I suppose. Uh, you get no credit for any of that, yet if you fail, likely it will go to a debt collector and end up getting reported uh, onto your, that, that feels like a, um, a, a sort of misalignment of the reporting system to, to many people, and it's something that continues to be a source of interest and concern and, and, and uh, consideration as to what to do about it. So. I ask a quick question, uh, following up on rent, that uh, I would be fascinated to know if you can pull out uh, for utility child and, and especially rent, uh, how much of not uh, being able to pay rent uh, is impacting people's uh, visibility or lack thereof? Uh, that would be a very fascinating number for me. Yeah, I don't think we've looked at that specifically. We can. I, I think it's a pretty small number. I mean, generally, we'll see in a little bit that the other non-loans category generally itself is a pretty small number. Well, one, um, one question I suppose people might be thinking about is, of the collection accounts reported, are you able to segment that into collection re accounts reported on failing on a credit card as opposed to failing on a mortgage or failing on something else? Are you able to do that? Or will you be able to over time, you think? So, so we have broad categorization. So for example, we could identify which of the collection accounts were medical related, um, which tended to be telecom. Um, I think there's a category for banks. So I don't know that we necessarily could distinguish between what was a mortgage or what was a credit card, but we can sort of see um, what was a One card. of the things Ken and his colleagues run into frequently is there might be more they'd like to know in the data, but the data just isn't collected that way. So one of the things we're trying to do over time is figure out how we might go about collecting it in that way or figuring out how we can take the data as exists and break it down to figure out uh, this meaning in it. That's that's part a big part of what they're trying to do. Ken, are you willing to take a couple more questions? Awesome. Chi Chi and then Jim. just try this with the weird feedback. Um, to, to follow up on Director Cordu's point, I wanted to ask you, um, in terms of the collection items, I would assume a lot of them are actually medical, given the previous research that the Bureau has done showing 50% of collection items are medical, something like 17% are, are telco, and so they're actually, the vast majority I would assume, are not financial accounts that have a prior um, account history of, of either positive or negative payments. Um, and then just to make the point we always do with respect to gas and electric utilities, we have some concerns about paying, uh, reporting full payment history for those because of the unique status of natural monopolies that are heavily regulated. Yeah, and I would just say too, I think that's a, it's an interesting observation, Director, that we do see. Uh, I think by definition these collection accounts are, are non-financial because this is the first visibility we're seeing for this group of people, right? In other words, to your point, if, if, if it's a financial account, you're seeing the positive payments, and then eventually some of those will end up in collections, but that won't create the visibility. They'll already have had visibility through the payments. And so these are collection accounts that, that don't come out of nowhere. Um, by, by definition, there's obligations then that aren't being paid. What that means is there are millions of other similarly situated consumers that are making payments um, that that are that would be positive 
that aren't being captured in the, in the system, in the bureaus, and that um, if, if we could look to those things, we could provide visibility before it, it goes to collection that, that would, would help people, I think, not only provide visibility, because you get visibility here, but it, it, it doesn't help you, right? It's just a negative thing on the file as a standalone thing, and we could, we could score that, but um, it's, it's very incomplete and, and not a reliable score. Um, but what's, what's important is to, is to find that, that positive data for the millions and, I, and you know, I think you talked about the fact that it, you know, these collection accounts are, it's the first thing for, for many low-income consumers. That means there's millions of low-income consumers that are making on-time payments of these types of, of payments. And it could be medical payments, it could be utility, it could be rental. But if we set out to find those positive payments, we could score those and provide visibility, positive visibility, that would be very helpful to consumers in, in, in terms of credit access. Can, can the I only thing I would quibble with what you said is saying that some of these are financial transactions. I mean, the problem here is they're all economic transactions. It's just that our system has defined credit as only applying to transactions that involve a loan. And there's many other economic transactions people engage in, uh, and it's as Ken's getting to here, the credit invisibles are engaging entirely in economic transactions that are non-credit, not, not defined as such. That's the flaw in our system. I don't want to take us too far off point with this because I know, I know Ken's research is, is not on this particular point today. But uh, so. well, Can I ask just one qu quick follow-up, which is um, in terms of maybe future research or if you saw anything, those who um, their entry point is collection items, ha are you able to follow their trajectory in terms of what happens to them? Do they actually get credit based on this you know, bad, you know, because we've often heard a bad score is better than no score, um, and I'm highly doubtful, so it would be interesting to see the trajectory of these consumers. Yeah, that's actually where, the, so the next study that we do along the lines of this is going to go look at exactly that. Um, I think I mentioned at a, a previous CAB meeting that I, I'd done some research with some colleagues at the Federal Reserve Board before I came to the CFPB that actually looked at some of these issues, particularly we're looking at how the, uh, the origins of, cre how credit score differences across races and ethnicities differed in how they emerged. Um, and it was really fascinating research because what you saw was that, you know, most, pop most of the different populations would start around the same level and then all of their scores would go down substantially. It's sort of like immediately bad things would happen or they would not, young people would not pay their bills. Their scores would go down. And what you saw for the differences across the minorities, uh, particularly African Americans and non-Hispanic whites, was that a lot of the difference really came in that early period, right? African Americans tended to have more negative items appear on their credit report very early in their life. It led to a separation, and that separation was maintained there out. Um, and I think that had interesting policy implications about how you might reach out to the African American community to sort of help them from early in their lives, to sort of help them from, from going on this track. And we actually, it was fascinating research. I presented it at a few different conferences and, and universities, and we never wrote it down. Uh, because we were too busy. So it's something I want to go back and revisit, um, and it, it'll be sort of the follow-up to, to this study here. Because uh, right now we're looking at sort of how people make the transition uh, into having a credit record. The next step will be, all right, once you've established a credit record, either because it was a collection account or an automobile loan or what have you, what happens, right? How do you actually, how does that play out? Because um, one of the things we're not going to look at in this study is we're not going to really categorize when you establish your credit history, did you establish a good history or a bad history quite yet? Right? And the reason is there's, there's a lot of shades of gray there, right? An auto loan may be great or maybe say good things about you once it's reported, but three months later it turns out to be negative, right? And so it, they're, they're a little bit hard to categorize in terms of just understanding that point of transition. Um, so we'll, we'll do that in a, a subsequent uh, part of this, or a subsequent study. The, the point of wistfulness here is that it would be great to come back and see what the CFPB will know, say, in the year 2050. And it'd be great if we could know it all now, which, of course, we don't. But Ken and his folks will see to it that, the, God willing, the later Consumer Bureau will be much more uh, knowledgeable and certain of itself on some of these issues. One more quick question. Josh? Yeah, just, um, just very quickly on, <coughs> on this topic. Uh, it's, and this is really interesting research, and it's good to see that you're going to follow on because many of these types of, uh, of accounts, even if they start positive, there's, there, you know, there's always a, a, you know, a risk of disparate impact in terms of high cost credit. And just one thing to point to in that is with student loans, um, I think the study said that 25 percent 
of initial collections, or, or sorry, of, of initial visit credit visibility is due to student loans. Uh, and there's a real risk there because uh, disproportionately people of color um, are steered into uh, the type of student loans that uh, are accompanying for-profit schools and trade schools where there really isn't, uh, the, you know, the education isn't what is advertised and people end up with high uh, debt. Uh, and in a, a degree that often doesn't help them uh, in getting employment uh, to pay off that debt. Uh, so the, there are so many layers of this, but it's, it's, it's critical, I think, as, as you're looking at this, to, to follow the types of debt um, and, and how that impacts people's uh, credit uh, going forward. To follow on that very briefly, for any form of credit where there are loss mitigation measures that are possible and somebody has sought those loss mitigation efforts and qualified for loss mitigation and yet was not given access, obviously, I mean, raises other questions about how that fits into damage to credit. When the student loan work that we do, we have, for example, people with disabilities, well documented, sent the records repeatedly to the servicer. Um, and were improperly denied until we got involved. You shouldn't have to have a lawyer get involved for something. That's just really obviously somebody's entitled to under the rules. I know that's going to be maybe hard to account for, but it'd be interesting to, to maybe try to figure out what percentage. However you do it in that brilliant statistical but logical fashion, <laughs> what is a rational way of trying to you know discount for or account for in some fashion that kind of bad behavior? One other thought also is on identity theft for young, younger folks. Um, uh, and I'm not, and that maybe that's a very tiny percentage of, that you're going to find as you d dig in deeper, but I am, I am interested in that. And that seems to happen at varying levels in some communities more than others. So thank you. All right, so I'll, I'll continue. Um, so we have entry products, which are the, the items that are reported to the credit bureaus that lead to the creation. Uh, of these very narrowly defined credit records. So the following shows the distribution of entry products by age group. So basically what this table shows is for each different age group, the percentage of people whose entry product was each of these eight different types uh, of credit product. We're actually only showing six of them here because if I'd, I'd shown eight, it wouldn't have fit on the slide. Um, so we've left off mortgages and personal or other loans, uh, both of which are, are very small in terms of percentages. Well, what sort of draws the eye on, on this table, I, I think, is first that credit cards are the dominant means by which consumers seem to establish or acquire credit histories, right? Across all the different age groups, uh, credit cards are the largest entry product by share uh, of any of the other products. The second most common overall are student loans, um, but that is almost entirely driven by people who are under 25. So consumers who transition out of credit and visibility before they turn 25, almost 20% of them do so using a student loan. Uh, for age groups above that, it, it's a much, much smaller percentage, right? The, the most of people who are 60 and older, um, it's below a percent. Uh, and the third most common use, or the third most common product is uh, retail. Uh, these include department credit scores, uh, and they tend to be a little bit more common amongst the older population. Now also, mm -hmm. Ken, does, does retail include rent to own, which is one a more common way of getting credit in low income communities? It should. Yeah. Okay, so they do report. Yeah. Well, um, I don't know how often they report, but if it's reported, it should have been put in the retail group. Okay, so it could, it could be that they only report when there's negative information. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And so the other thing that, that sort of draws the eye here is that about 15% of people overall have their credit rec report created as a result of either a collection uh, or one of these other non-loan categories. So th this is a population who starts their credit report with one of these non-loan uh, items. And even though we've generally tried to, or I've generally tried to avoid categorizing the start of a credit history as either positive or negative, because the, particularly with the loans, it's a far, fairly nuanced uh, determination. But for these non-loan items, 90% of them are items that, when they're reported, always convey information that would be considered negative, right? So they're debt collections, they're uh, tax liens. Well, uh, is is, is non-loan the right adjective to use? Wouldn't a lot of the collections stem from loans? It, it <laughs> so the, the share of collections that come from loans, I think, is relatively small. Is that right? Yes. 
Okay. Um, and well, I should say the share of collections overall, the, the, the accounts that are being collected by third party debt collectors, a lot of them are loans. Mm -hmm. I don't think very many of them are reported to the credit bureaus. Okay. And I think there are a lot of the reason for that is that if you have a credit card and it goes delinquent, that's been reported by the credit card company. And if it was then reported by a third party debt collector, you would essentially be penalizing the same consumer twice for the same delinquent. Because it's first reported by a collector, it's likely to be a non delinquent. That's right. And so I think the, the reporting to the bureaus of, of third-party debts that are, are loan-related is, is relatively small. Two um, quick questions, but I assume are follow-ons to this. First Kathleen, then Joanne. I think I just wanted some clarification. If this is people's first encounter with a credit report, wouldn't it be the case that if it was a loan, at least from a financial institution or a credit card, that would get reported as the first encounter? The debt collection would be later. So that may be why. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that's very true. I, I will also say a lot of third party, party debt collectors have stopped reporting. The requirements because of accuracy and having policies and procedures is just too onerous. Uh, the, the risk of error is too high. So a lot of them are just stopping. Uh, it's just better to not to do it. Just a clarification. You said that 90% of collections items are negative. What kind of collection item could be positive? Sorry, it, it was 90% of the non-loans, which includes the collection items and the other category. Thank you. Right, so you're right. All, all the collection items we're considering is, is always negative when they're reported. Except for other categories, not the other categories. Yes, that's, okay. yeah. Uh, wasn't the other about non-payment of... Not always. So, so it, it could be things like... child support or other issues? Yeah, the, the child support payments would have been negative, um, but things like utility payments sometimes are reported even though they're not delinquent. Um, and there are other types of accounts, rental payments that maybe are being reported and the person's actually current on sometimes but delinquent on others. So since they're not uniformly negative, they're in this 10%. Now a lot of that 10% may also be items that have gone negative, so utility payment that for one consumer they didn't pay and it was reported as being derogatory. And so the 90% is sort of a lower bound on, on what that might be. Uh, but it's disproportionately these non-loans are, are negative when they're reported. So in thinking about the, the importance of credit cards in establishing credit histories, um, one of the ways that a credit card could be established is the use of secured credit cards, where the consumer puts down a deposit before the account is open, and that deposit could be used to cover losses should the consumer not repay the debt. So we're interested in how many of these credit card uh, accounts that were basically establishing someone's credit history might have been the result of the use of, of secured credit cards. So we took all of the credit card entry products that we observed in the data. Um, the, the column there under credit cards just reproduces the column from the previous table. So the 35.6% of people under 25 established their credit history from a credit card. Of those, 34.7% um, did, did so using what appears to be an unsecured card, and about 0.9%, or less than 1%, used a credit score, or used, I'm sorry, used a secured credit card. So about 2.5% of that age group um, made the transition, 2.5% uh, of the population that made the transition out of credit and visibility using a credit card did so using a secured credit card. And what you can see is that the use of secured credit cards as an entry product uh, appears to be relatively low. Um, it, it's much more common amongst people in middle age um, than it is older or younger consumers. Uh, so it also seems that uh, most of the use of credit cards to establish credit history doesn't seem to be relying on the use of these secured cards. I wonder if this this group between like 25 and 50, mm -hmm. the middle aged people, I'd like well, I'd like to make middle age a little older just mm -hmm. for self interest purposes. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, I'm wondering if these are people who are going into secured credit cards because of some financial trouble, right? Something that didn't get onto a credit report, but that prevented them from getting an, an unsecured card. Yep. I think I wonder if that's what it's picking up. Although you would expect they would have had some del something on their credit report in this age group, like a bankruptcy at least or something, and they wouldn't have, right, mm -hmm. to be in this. So that's sort of curious. I'd like, I'm interested in what's up with those people. Yeah, we don't really have a. Sorry, we we don't really have anything in the data that would tell us sort of why they chose a secured credit card. Um, it, it's possible that some of these consumers had a previous bankruptcy and they then became credit invisible because all the information on their credit report migrated off. And then maybe they didn't even realize that it was all gone. Then you go out and you know that for the past several years you've been unable to get a credit card. So when you try to get one this time, you go and take a secured route. Uh, but we, we have no way of really verifying if, if that's true or not directly from these data. Uh, 
So one of the results that we observed in our earlier data point also was that there were significant differences in the incidence of being credit invisible across different neighborhood income levels, right? Credit bureau records themselves do not contain any information about the income of, of borrowers. But what we can do is because we know the census tract associated with each of the credit records in our data set, we can categorize the neighborhood, the income level of the neighborhood in which the borrower resides and use that as a method of understanding sort of how the transition out of credit and visibility varies between lower or, or moderate or upper income consumers. Uh, and so we're going to categorize each track based upon a, a concept known as relative income. Uh, for people who are familiar with the Community Reinvestment Act or the Affordable Housing Goals of the GSEs, this should be a familiar concept. It's something that's been used, uh, I think, for quite a long while. And it's basically relative income is you take the median family income in a census tract and you compare it to the median family income of the surrounding area, the surrounding area being for urban tracts, the metropolitan statistical area, or whatever they call those now. Uh, and for rural tracts, it's the non-metropolitan portion of a state. And you take that ratio, and that tells you something about the income level uh, of the community in a way that allows you to adjust for the fact that the same dollar amount of income may mean different things in different parts of the country. And so there are four uh, income levels that are created from this. Low, which are people whose relative income is below 50 percent. Moderate, 50 to 79 percent. Middle, 80 to 119 percent. And then the upper income communities, which would be 120 percent. Uh, relative income or higher. And so this, or this table shows the distribution of the observations in our data set across these different uh, income groups. Um, overall, you generally see that the share of, of people in, in low, moderate communities tends to be relatively low. Um, this is not surprising because there aren't as many people who live in mo low to moderate income neighborhoods as there are overall. So as a, a way of comparing what we see in our sample versus the, the population that's sort of available, the column all the way to the right, the percent of invisibles, this is a number that we produced as part of our earlier study, which shows the percentage of the population of people who are credit invisible who reside in, in low-income neighborhoods. Right? So if you looked at the entire population of people who are credit invisible, 14.3% of them live in low-income neighborhoods. In our sample of people who transition out of credit invisibility, about 7.5% of them appear to be in low-income low neighborhoods. And so what you can see from that comparison is that in low-income neighborhoods, the share who appear to be making the transition is consistently lower than the share who were out there, or the, the, the entire portion of the population. Right? So low-income com communities, there's 7.5% of transitioners, 14.3% of the population that could transition. Moderate income communities are 24% of the transitioners, but 32% uh, of the available population. And in upper income communities, you see that the, the percentages are much larger, right? The consumers who are credit invisible, only 10% of them live in upper income communities. But in our data, it looks like 25, they account for 25% of the people who make the transition uh, out of credit invisibility. So this is sort of consistent with the results um, that we found in an earlier data point where consumers in upper income neighborhoods seem to be able to make this transition more readily than people in, in lower income communities. Uh, and consistent with that also is that if you look at the age of uh, which this transition was made, there's not a lot of differences, but it is the case that consumers in lower income communities tended to transition out of credit and visibility a little bit later in life uh, than did people uh, in higher income communities. And if you look at the share of people who actually had become visible by the time they were 25, you're now starting to talk about a difference of about maybe 8% of the population. Now, if you look at the ways in which these uh, consumers in these different communities made the transition out of credit and visibility, uh, across, we, we get the graph uh, shown here. Once again, if you look at credit cards across all, all four different income levels, credit cards are the dominant means of transitioning out of credit and visibility. Uh, they're more commonly used than any of the uh, other products in all four uh, income levels. In terms of student loans, student loans are much less common uh, in low-income communities. About 12% of consumers or 13% of consumers use the student loan to transition out of credit and visibility, compared to about almost 18% in upper-income communities. But I, I think the real difference here is in the collection and, and the other items, these non-loan categories. Almost 27% of consumers in low-income communities had their credit record created as a result of one of these non-loan items being reported. Right? These non-loan items, which I said earlier, are almost always negative when they're reported. In upper-income communities, the number's a whole lot smaller. It's about 8%. 
Um, so what we're seeing is that of consumers who are sort of making this transition in lower income communities, you're less likely to make the transition. And when you do, you're more likely to make the transition as a result of negative information. Is there, uh, this may not be where you're going with this research, or maybe you're not going there at this point in the research, this stage, but is there a how to take away from any of this? Does this tell us that for people who are having trouble making the transition to credit visibility, they, or perhaps we as policymakers, or perhaps financial institutions, should be trying to make more efforts to get them credit cards? Uh, because it is such a natural way to sort of make this transition? Should there be more aggressive offering of secured credit cards? That is, is there any sort of takeaway here as to what, yet as to what we might do to try to address the problem of the invisibles? Yeah, this is jumping a little bit ahead, but I, I would say one of the takeoffs for me is that we see a lot of people making this transition using credit cards that they take out by themselves. And I don't know that I have a really good feel for what it is, what pieces of information lenders are using to decide if two people come into my shop, neither of whom has a credit record, why is it that I'm giving a credit card to some but not others? And so there are other items of information that I don't know that I have a really good sense for what those are. And it could be, you know, it could be that they're checking income, or it could be that the banks that are offering credit cards are using deposit accounts, right? So if you have a customer who comes in with no credit record, but they have a banking account or a checking account that they've maintained with the bank for some time, they're using that. And that, therefore, some of the differences that we observe across low to moderate income communities may be a reflection of the fact that consumers in these neighborhoods tend to be more unbanked in terms of deposit services. And what this says is that one of the ways of sort of dealing or, or, or leaving the problem of credit invisibility may not necessarily be, you know, only to rely on alternative data, but it could also be trying to address the unbanked problems in these communities, right? Making sure that these consumers have access to deposit services that then lead them to establish these relationships with financial institutions that they can, can use to transition into credit visibility. Um, it, it, you're not these slides yet, but uh, your research also seems to suggest that maybe we should be trying to consider uh, consumer groups or community groups, uh, financial mentor programs for people. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could get people hooked up with someone who would be willing to be the co-borrower or the user in the authorized mm -hmm. account if they had enough of a relationship to feel comfortable doing that. Maybe more aggressive efforts should be made to do that. that that's what seems to be happening sort of readily and easily in the upper income areas, uh, higher income areas, but not so much in the lower income areas, perhaps just because they lack anybody to, to be available to help them. Uh, and that, that may be a tough thing to do. The other thing I worry, wonder about is uh, the other issue for one of the others today is the retail cards that we're going to get to in a minute. Uh, if a lot of people are going in and getting retail cards as a way to establish credit, and if some of those products are trickier, then it's yet another reason for us to be concerned about trying to make sure those are true zero interest products that might be clear to people because it's, it's going to lead some of them uh, into a bad area. Got a few follow-up questions. At, let me start with um, Neil Paulina. Neil then Paulina. I see you, Chi-Chi. So I wonder, uh, in terms of the products that you're looking at to uh, kind of enter the credit, uh, is, is payday loans on your, or a small dollar on your radar screen? So generally, no. I mean, most payday loans are not reported directly to the right. Bureau. So, some will be indirectly reported by third-party debt collectors if they go into default, uh, but generally, no. So, so back to the director's point about entry-level product then. So I wonder if there's an opportunity here to either get the payday lenders to mm -hmm. report or uh, thinking as you're doing rulemaking on small dollar, uh, positioning the rules to encourage banks or other, you know, mainstream financial institutions to actually get more involved there. Um, thank you for this research. It's extremely important. Um, one of the um, questions I have, I don't remember if you said whether the collection and the other category here is actually broken down in the research in terms of um, whether you know whether it's medical or or rent. Um, and then I have a follow-up to that because if, or maybe I can just say it now, because if it is medical or negative rent or utility payments, then it seems like it's more of an income problem um, or an in income challenge for families? Because if that's the first, if it was a credit card as a first point of entry, we would see it here. But if the first point of entry is a collection account or an other, then it's an, it seems like an income problem. And so then 
you get into the cycle where you're not able to qualify for that credit card, um, and then you're stuck in this cycle of you know bad credit um, and not able to get back into the positive. So there is both an income issue and then there's the financial mentorship issue of how do you get yourself out of that cycle. But until you until you deal with the income issue, it's it's constantly you're constantly in that cycle, which is why I think. Um, there's a connection between all the work that the Bureau is doing. Um, going back to the small business point um, that the director made at the very beginning about how small businesses are an economic engine. And so if, um, if the lending is not happening there and small businesses in low-income areas are not um, having that access to financing, then there's also a trajectory that affects um, income uh, and, and the economy of those counties. And so I just wanted to make that make that connection. Yeah, thanks. In, in, we actually don't talk in the paper a lot about the types of collections that we hear, but we did an analysis. And so the dominant form of collections across all the different income groups was, was medical. Um, so it was more than 50% of people in low-income communities and more than 50% of people in upper-income communities who made the transition via a collection account. And I think we would agree with the other things you said. The only thing I would say is with medical debt, it's not so clear that that's an income problem because what we found is a lot of medical debt is fairly random. Uh, it, is, it, is a, uh, it is a very questionable um, uh, credit reporting item. Uh, people don't even realize sometimes five, ten dollar copay or something finds its way onto their, they don't even realize they were supposed to pay that, they're confused and so forth. It's, it's a whole separate interesting category that our folks are looking at. So. A couple more questions. Brian, then Jim, I see you, Patrick, and thank you. Thanks. And this is good research. Every installment that comes out is, is more educational, so it's so interesting. So just a couple of things. I think we're sort of hitting on some of the levers to improve visibility. Uh, among them we fit on, I think, education, starter product, data, and, and then one I'd like to add to the discussion is distribution uh, and servicing. On the data side, I think, Ken, you asked, uh, you know, how do you pick uh, from one or the other? And um, at, at present, there isn't, you know, having some experience in this as an issuer, there, there isn't a whole lot to pick from. The, 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 where we've seen success are th around things like presence of a banking account, um, household relationship uh, with another product, um, and then also uh, education uh, are all good predictors. Um, what we don't have a lot of at this point are a lot of the positive data that, that Jim mentioned earlier. There's a plethora of data out there, but the data that is available FCRA compliant and then fair lending compliant is is very very minimal, uh, and so anything that could be done to sort of unlock the good data, I think, is will will help. Regarding starter products, uh, we we've offered a secured card uh, for you know for for some years now, and what's what's interesting on secured card is the number of consumers that just don't understand. Uh, how it actually works uh, might perceive the deposit as as a fee that'll sort of never come back to them. So, so to the comments on education, uh, the more that can be done to educate consumers as to how the product works, uh, the, the better established it may be, and and maybe a, a more uh, a lever to visibility. And then the other thing to consider um, are just uh, when it comes to distribution and product distribution, um, the the ability to make digital a more easy way to distribute. Um, mainstream financial products, and I think anything that could be done to, to modernize uh, the regulations around it uh, would be beneficial, particularly around disclosures, uh, how disclosures are made over a, over a digital medium, and then also, uh, Director Corday, some of your comments on, on uh, telephone collection practices and the like, modernizing that regulation, because if you can, if you can modernize the regulations to make digital easier, it reduces the cost to serve and, and makes it easier to distribute products uh, directly uh, to this group, and so uh, uh, TCPA is one, and then uh, you know around some of the disclosures is another, which which are you know somewhat cumbersome over a, over a digital medium, uh, and if those could be better, it, it might make distribution easier. One of the takeaways I feel from having read the draft of this report and then the report and then seeing the presentation, it finally starts to seep in a little bit. The one thing that I think is pretty clear is a rising tide that would lift all boats in this area is uh, the households that are completely unbanked almost certainly, I don't know if you will be able to or have yet been able to correlate that with the invisibles, but that's going to be a, a huge issue that's more likely to dump them into the bad categories. If we could get more people into the banking system with these safe banking products, that at least, I don't know exactly how that would move into the mechanisms for doing these things, but it's going to give them much more of a fighting chance, it seems. 
uh, and, and perhaps a safe bank account coupled with a secure credit card. You also seem to be suggesting uh, that um, if m maybe we need to be thinking about and finding a way to do a simpler, more transparent secured credit card. Maybe it's, it is complicated for people. Does it have to be? Is there some other way to do it that would be a little less complicated? I, I don't know, but that comes to mind. Great. Jim? Um, thanks, Ken. Interesting data. The, the, I'm about to ask about, about an area that is probably beyond, beyond the bounds of what's possible, but, it, but it, because it could be a, an area of, of high interest, high impact society in the whole, it could be worth considering. Ask you, for the moon and they'll at least give you a street light. Th there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe you could append survey data and make some, some inferences. So the, the concern is these disproportionately younger people who have had negative actions reported on their credit information uh, and, you know, we, we know that there are problems with lower income people, and especially in, in uh, you know, certain neighborhoods and so forth, that, that, are, um, that they can't find gainful employment. So my, my, I'm wondering if it would be possible, again, probably through inference and other data, to identify uh, inquiries on, um, on one's credit history by potential employers showing that people who had a worsened credit rating tended to get more inquiries by, by employers that offer like less desirable employment, and they're going a step further and asking for the moon, finding that that could be correlated with arrest records. Because I simply, I, I made a poor financial decision, I couldn't find gainful employment, I took a crummy job, now I'm giving up in the system, and I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm willing to take a risk and I end up in jail. Yes, th that would be difficult. So in the credit record data that we have, we have information on hard inquiries, which are inquiries that are made when the consumer seeks out credit. Um, the, the inquiries that are made in connection with employment are soft inquiries, and as far as I've understood from my conversations with the Bureau that's providing us with the data, they don't have a means of providing that. They don't normally provide it to lenders, so it, it would be hard to do it for us. Um, the, the, the arrest records is an interesting thing, and we've actually been working trying to figure out if there are ways that we can get data on arrest records. Uh, there had been a professor at Wharton who I was talking about who had arrest records for, for Texas, and we were talking about possibly trying to figure out if there was a way to merge the two data sets in a way that maintained the anonymity of, of the consumers in our sample, because we would be very interesting to see sort of how that's affecting credit, um, both before you wind up being arrested, right? Does there seem to be some relationship between financial distress and being arrested? And then not, what does it do to you subsequently, and not only you, but what does it do to the people you may share accounts with or who are perhaps part of your household? Uh, I think that's something that we're Person, I'm personally very much interested in it. So hopefully, we'll be able to get there eventually. But I, I think the employment side of it's going to be a little bit trickier to get at. Patrick and then Aryan, did you have your hand up or you were not? Yes, Patrick, Aryan, and then Chi Chi. Uh, just two things. One, first to respond to Neil's question. You know, when we pull our payday loan customers or, or files, it's only about three to four percent usually that are invisible. It's very rarely their only uh, or first source of credit. It's usually they're, they're much more mature in the credit cycle. Um, but secondly, just, you know, I think it, it, this goes back to two points Director Corder made. I think the idea of sort of trying to, when you look at this paradigm and trying to force people into this paradigm that is what we call the credit bureaus or credit rating, credit scoring is, is, is probably uh, fraught with problems and errors. And instead, and I think this plays a lot into the alternative data discussion, is that instead of fitting people into this paradigm, say, is this the right paradigm to really measure someone's credibility? And uh, some of the conversations we had earlier, particularly around credit cards being the key entry point, is, you know, credit cards used to serve a utility of, of just being able to enable payments that, that, that wasn't available otherwise. Now there's multiple ways of enabling those payments, and so when you look at someone uh, that, 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 uh, that makes payments through PayPal and debit and other things, those don't show up in this paradigm. Right? If they happen to be making the same payments on a credit card, they're in this group and paradigm. But the behavior you're trying to get to is really the same, whether it's through a credit card or some alternative means. So I think that really comes back to that alternative data discussion is, it, you know, paying your bills is what you're trying to find. The, the, the patterns are the same. It's just, you know, whether they fit in this box or not. Yeah, I think that's the point I was trying to make earlier. I think you just made it better, is that people have lots of economic activity in their lives. 
this is a skewed way of measuring it because only certain kinds of economic activities get get added into this system, and for some of them, it's only negative side of those that gets added into the system and positive sides left out. That it's it's a problem, and it, it does call into question the validity of this system or whether we can do better. Ayan then Chichi. I'm I'm glad. Uh, you, director, and others are asking, so what, uh, about this research, and that that's the right thing to be asking. Um, my sense, having been working in and around financial services for low-moderate income consumers, is that a lot of the so what's that we're exploring here are, are going to be fundamentally ameliorative at best, um, which, sadly, within the context of this bureau, uh, but maybe, you know, opportunistically, you know, kind of presents the issue of we have a very particular jurisdiction, and right, we're we're stuck within a very narrow can confine of someone's life. When you say ameliorative, you you mean improving, but only a little bit. Is that yeah. what you mean? Yeah. So n not as far-reaching as yeah. you hope and like. Yeah. So to build on Paulina's co comment and maybe where Jim was going, you know, I think at some fundamental level, you know, in finding ways to increase someone's income is is really, even even a little bit, really takes care of in a much greater way of a lot of the stuff that we would just be able to, you know, add sand between the cracks through some of the reporting, promoting a different kind of product, et cetera. Um, again, it, it, it's a little hard to talk about these topics, you know, in the confines of the CFPB, um, but I do think it's important and maybe it, it maybe the uh, the, the call or challenge or something like that is to find ways to reach out to others to find ways to solve for that. It doesn't go any farther than that. Oh, okay. Here. <laughs> Sorry, I was instructed to use this microphone because that one has a problem. <laughs> um, so a, a few thoughts on a lot of the um, themes that have been going around. Um, first of all, on the issue of um, a lot of these unsecured cards maybe um, uh, being underwritten based upon deposit account activity, um, you know, obviously the things I think of immediately are, okay, so what role does check systems then and early warning services have in, you know, deterring low-income consumers from getting banking accounts um, and then not being able to form that deposit relationship, which then leads to the unsecured card. Um, and, you know, safe accounts is a great way to address that as a policy matter. So I totally agree with that. Research-wise, you know, whether you can get checks or, or EWS information and sort of cross-match it would be interesting. Um, you know, when we did our report on, on checks and EWS, one thing we heard about anecdotally was that a lot of youth were at, ending up with checks records. And you would think, how does that happen? And, you know, uh, to Mava, uh, as point, identity theft, um, you know, their, their identity is being borrowed by family members to be able to open up accounts. Um, uh, and then, of course, you know, deposit accounts, there's the issue of being able to share that information because if it's only your, your, your bank that you have a deposit account with that locks you into that bank um, to be able to get an unsecured card plus, it means you have to go to one of the um, deposit banks that also offers a major credit card product, right? If you're banking with a community bank and they don't offer a credit card, then you don't get that same benefit unless you can share that information. Um, on secured offerings, you know, there is research by um, CFSI about the, the barriers to why there's such a low percent and, and mo um, you know, it has to do more with visibility and um, lack of knowledge than, I think, regulatory barriers. Um, and then on medical collections, um, it'd be interesting to run this research a few years after um, the reforms due to the multi-state AG settlement and the National Consumer Assistance Program kick in where you have that 180-day sort of grace period before medical debts show up. Thank you very much, Chi-Chi. And I know I have other people lined up because we are very, very interested in the topic and the research you've done already, Ken. But I want to check in with you because we also have a deferred uh, uh, interest uh, presentation. Do you have any perhaps maybe – what I want to ask is that we hold these final remarks, and I'm sorry because we can't do everything but with the amount of time we have. have left that you to get perhhaps. To I'm about halfway through. <laughs> <laughs> Are there a few final slides? Speed, speed 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do sort of the highlights of, of what remains. Thanks. So the, the main section that comes after this is, is sort of the role of other people in helping people acquire a credit history, right? So if, if you yourself, perhaps because you're credit invisible, go to a lender and are able, unable to get a loan yourself, you may be able to, for example, enlist the help of a, a co-borrower. So we wanted to look at how many of these first reported pieces of information uh, were, take, were loans that were taken out with the help of somebody else. Uh, and so this shows you the share of each of the different entry type products that were opened up with a co-borrower. Um, the results there are, are not all that surprising. Um, the real sort of significant difference, I think, is I think if you look at what the share is, the share of these different loan types that are taken out with a co-borrower across neighborhood income levels. Um, so what we've done here is we've plotted the shares uh, for, the for the six different loan types that we have in the data. Uh, for low, moderate, middle, and upper income levels. We've sorted them in a slightly different way than they are in the tables to make them easier to see. Uh, in this case, the, the share of uh, co-borrower accounts uh, is, is declining from left to right. And what you see is that if you look at middle and upper income consumers, most of the people who make that transition, they have a very similar share of those entry products that involve a co-borrower. But if you look at moderate areas or moderate income areas and low income areas, you're seeing much less, less or much lower tendencies uh, to rely on co-borrowers across these different products, with the one exception being retail, where uh, all four income areas tend to have about the same level of, uh, of co-borrower participation. And then we also looked at the role of authorized users. Authorized users status is, is one way that uh, people traditionally have gotten access to uh, a credit record. Um, it's the way that I personally got access back when I was 18. Um, and the way this works is that you have somebody who has a credit card who has the ability to add, allow somebody else to use that credit card without them incurring any legal liability. Um, so in, in my case, when I, was eight, when I was 18 and I had a, a car, my mother made me an authorized user on her credit card. And one of the things that this did is that once I was added to that credit card, the entire history of that account was added to my credit record. So even though I was 18, if that was a 20-year credit record, that entire 20-year history wound up being reported on my credit record. So I instantly had a credit record that allowed me to get credit from other users, um, which actually was my mother's point in doing this. She worked for a credit card company. She gave me, made me an authorized user on the card, gave me a card, told me if I ever used it in a situation that she did not deem an emergency, there would be hell to pay. <laughs> and then eventually Citibank sent me an, uh, a letter in the mail saying, hey, you want a card? They gave me one, and uh, we tore that one up. So I wanted to understand how the use of authorized users to, to acquire credit history was playing out. Uh, and also, again, particularly looking across uh, different neighborhood income levels. So overall, uh, about 19% of people have an authorized user account uh, on their credit record. Uh, about half of these, that population tends to use at least one authorized user account to sort of make their entry into the credit reporting system. So about 10% of the population overall had an authorized user account that appears to have appeared on their credit record before any of their other uh, products. Uh, and on average, when, they, when the authorized user account appeared on their credit record, generally it was about five years of credit history that they were acquiring right off the bat. And if you look across income levels, what you see again is that this tendency uh, of people to use authorized user status or use the credit history of, of someone else to help themselves acquire credit uh, is much higher in upper income communities than it is in lower income communities. Um, so there, in general, people in lower income communities were much less likely to have an authorized user account, uh, and they were much less likely to have the authorized user account be the first thing that appeared on their credit record. Um, and when the authorized user account did appear on their credit record, they seems to have acquired less credit history. So if you take these two pieces of information together, the fact that about 15% of people have their entry product be a, with a co-borrower, and an additional roughly 10% of the population tends to have their entry be via an authorized user account. About one in four people in our data, it looks like, tends to acquire their credit history as a result of, at least in part, somebody else. And that this, this tendency tends to be much lower in lower and moderate income communities. So it seems that one of the barriers to, to credit visibility that I don't think is, is talked about quite as much may be the inability to rely on others to help you make this transition. Um, and so I don't have a lot of time, so I, I won't really go through the changes by time. I think most people in the room have, 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 have read the document, it seems. So um, if anyone has questions, I'd love to answer them. Otherwise, I'll see the rest of my time. I think we will have to wrap up on this point. Thank you very much for your great research. Thanks, everybody, for really great discussion, comments, input. Um, I'm sure people will have, do have much more to say to you. Um,
we want to transition into deferred interest, and we have with us today um, Wei Zhang with credit card pay the credit card program manager with Cards Payments and Deposit Markets. Thank you so much. Sorry to be starting so late. Uh, appreciate your being here, and we also have uh, Will Wade Gary, assistant director at Cards Payments and uh, Deposits. Um, please take it away. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I have to confess that we actually don't have a presentation here to share with you, uh, but we would rather use this opportunity uh, to have a conversation to solicit some feedback from all of you about this product. Uh, I can begin by just highlight some uh, facts that director mentioned earlier, as well as some context uh, around the study uh, that we have done so far, as well as some latest uh, market development. Uh, so deferred interest, as you all know, is a very popular product. It's available virtually every retail establishment, uh, from appliance stores, uh, medical providers, as well as jewelers, and uh, some home improvement uh, stores. Uh, so we first uh, studied this product uh, reported in 2013 in our report, where we actually find most majority of the consumers actually successfully manage the product. Where eight, I mean successful, I mean 80% of consumers actually can pay that deferred uh, the entire balance before the promotion ended. Only 20% for some reason couldn't do, do so. So in 2015, we actually looked into this 20% population very closely. We tried to figure out you know, what's the reason actually causing them couldn't pay. You know, similar to other uh, data analytical work, you know, we don't have a perfect data actually to gauge what consumers actually think. But at least some data point can give us some correlation in terms why they actually didn't manage to pay the whole balance off at the end of the promotion. So one key observation uh, as highlighted by a director, that's where the 20% of the population where they couldn't pay during the promotion, however, they made rapid payment immediately after promotion ended. So I kind of can imagine a situation where consumer probably initially didn't understand the product well. Then all of a sudden, at the end of the promotion, they have assumed have very small balance. All of a sudden, a big finance charge being added to that balance. This is where kind of a wake up call where, oh gosh, actually this is how product works. So the data at least provide some kind of correlation to that scenario where people realize there's a, this is actually how the product works. So this is one key highlight that we, we find in our research. Uh, the other part uh, kind of make the situation a little bit more difficult. Because if you look at the different interest pr promotion, this is typically more looks like a, a installment loan. You make payment on a fixed pur amount purchase. But same time, actually, this is part of your credit revolving line. So that means when you have a purchase in the promotion, same time, actually, you have the ability to continue to use the card, to make more purchases on the card. So with multiple balances on the card, make managing the promotion or payoff very difficult. This is where we find. Can, Again, can, I, can I emphasize this point for a minute? Because this is one of the things you all kind of explained to me over the course of preparing for the speech and so forth, and I had not grasped it before that. Uh, I had tended to think about this situation as one where consumer with no prior history goes into a store, gets a card on a promotion, and ha then carries a balance and goes forward uh, and, you know, tries to pay off that balance in the time. Uh, no prior events, history, et cetera. Then there's the added complication of they go in, they get this card, promotional balance, et cetera, but then they may use the card a few times over the course of that same period. And then, you know, it's a little confusing perhaps to them whether they're still paying on that promotion or whether they paid that off first and then the other payments come later, et cetera. But yeah, I think one of the points you've made to me that I hadn't quite grasped is this can actually be even more confusing in a sense because the person might have had this store card for some time. They don't always get the store card for the promotional balance. The promotion might, might not be at the time they take out the card. Is that correct? 
they, 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 they could have a history at the store and some charges and things and then get a promotion on top of that. So there might be a prehistory as well as a post history. Is that right? It's not always the brand new card. Okay, got it. That, so it's even more confusing. And you get the same effect if you go, it doesn't have to yes. be new purchases during the promotional period, it could simply be going in with an existing balance. Yeah. Then you've got promotional and non-promotional at the same time. Yes. It's very complicated. Absolutely. So this is where we find, for, for those people who actually uh, fail to pay the whole thing off with, with multiple balances, we, are, we actually find over 50% of the users who actually paid more than the promotional balance and still end up being charged the deferred interest. It's even worse when you look at the stream, over one third of the population actually paid over 150% of, of the initial balance and still end up being charged the deferred interest. So this, this is kind of a highlight where, you know, the concept itself is not that straightforward. Second, because the revolving nature of other balances, you know, consumer use over time, that make just very difficult to manage. Uh, so those are the key observations that we find. Also con uh, on that is this market actually grew very rapidly. Uh, the data available to us show over 20% growth rate from 2010 to 2013. So again, this is a very uh, popular product. Uh, so in light of the uh, announcement that uh, uh, Direct Quality mentioned, Walmart make this change where kind of remove the default feature of this product. So like I said earlier, where 80% population actually manage this product successfully. They end up paying no re retroactive interest at all. So under the true zero scenario, you can imagine this population basically will get the same results. They will continue to get 0% finance charge. There's no change to them. However, for the remaining 20%, in particular, in case where we find uh, certain consumers actually have very small balance left at the end of the promotion, but still end up being charged a very large sum of the deferred interest. So imagine a situation where you know the consumer in the first place may have some difficulties to pay that smaller balance, then end up with a larger finance charge on that balance. So clearly, this calculation will make them harsh, even harder. So this is where we welcome this change, and uh, we hope you know others could follow and uh, make the change accordingly. Uh, so, like I said earlier, this is really kind of not a presentation. Rather, we want to uh, hear from you. What do you think about this change? Uh, what do you think about product? So, you know, personally, I use this product quite often. I, I buy a pair of uh, washer dryer and then manage it successfully. Uh, I did my floor using the same product. I think probably partially due to the fact that I spent too much time researching this product. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have a, a clear confidence to support it, but at least you know, this is what my experience. This is how we get all the disclosures. We just send way out to buy stuff. Yeah. So really kind of, you know, I want to turn around and ask you, you know, uh, you know, what your experience, have you ever used this product? What do you think about the risks and benefits of this product? Great, we have Judy and then Chi Chi. So I too just bought my washer and dryer with the, uh, what did I say, six months same as cash or whatever, uh, which brings up some sort of positives and negatives. So I really support the idea of having 0% you know, interest as opposed to this deferred interest. Uh, largely because of the confusion. In my recent experience, um, the uh, store that we purchased this from, which we've bought appliances from over the years, um, never sent a statement. They emailed my husband, and my husband doesn't read his email. So <laughs> we, we, I kept saying to him, you know, wh why we should be getting something, you know, in the mail. And I finally called them and, you know, discovered that they've been sitting in my husband's email. So I do think it's, conf and, and I've noticed that more and more, um, you know, some people like electronic statements, but I think it's a problem that we, that, that some places are automatically um, going to that without full disclosure. And, you know, in our situation, it wasn't good. Um, the other thing I think is that the card act has improved how these things get reported. Um, I have found myself, um, getting one of these promotions and not even knowing it 
you know, like you, you go to a, a store and you buy something and then when your bill comes, there's like, this is your promotional level. I was like, I didn't even know I, I did that. Um, I, I think it's good that it's broken out. Um, but I also think that's really confusing because you can't allocate what you're paying. In other words, if, if you, s unless you pay the whole balance off at that time, but, but if you just send in a payment, it gets allocated to not the promotion. It gets allocated first to the non-promotion item, and that's confusing to consumers. You send it in and try to indicate to them you want Yeah, because to it's all them. computerized. You know, you know, a person's not looking at it, right? So, so I think it would be useful if there would be a way you could do that. You know, like I want to pay fifty dollars on my balance, and I want to pay my whole promotion off. You know, and you could allocate. And and as far as I've been able to figure out, there's no way to do that. And then my third point is, um, I, I must be with Chi Chi up late at night watching uh, Star Trek, uh, watching all these commercials. But um, and Max isn't here. He mentioned to us before that you know mattresses are the things that people do this for the most, but I was watching a commercial for a uh, mattress salesman and they were offering um, four years, same as cash, which as I was watching that, I was thinking, is that deferred or is that 0% interest? It's probably deferred, but I could see you watching that ad thinking that you had four years to pay and had no interest. And if you didn't pay for four years and missed a payment, you'd have an awful lot of interest. I mean, these things tend to be short term, but that was very long term. And I think one of the problems here is that if you look at the advertisements, it's very hard for a consumer to figure out if it's zero interest or deferred interest. Just on the allocation issues, there's a range of practices. So the Card Act says that until the last two months of the promo, um, with a caveat, the issuer would have to allocate to the non-promo balance. And then that switches, I'm not talking about the minimum payment, I'm talking about a month above the minimum payment, that switches in the last two months to make the default allocation to the promo balance. The Card Act does permit, but does not require, the issuer to allocate differently upon consumer request, and there's a range of practices there. So some issuers actually communicate to cardholders that they can make that allocation change, um, and then honor those requests. Some honor those requests, but don't communicate to cardholders that they can make those requests, and some won't honor those requests even if made. There's a range of practices there. Yeah, and, and, I, and I will say, I don't think it's very clear to the cardholder how to make, even make the request. Thank you. In the interest of time, because we're being recorded, we're gonna have a hard stop at noon um, for a public session, we've got six comments. I'd like to ask staff if we can take the six comments so people, everybody has a chance to be heard, and if all of you would be commenters, uh, would be snappy. That would be great. Thank you. I will try to talk really fast because <laughs> I have a lot of comments. I mean, first, obviously, terrific research um, by the by way and the credit card team. Um, there was so much more in that 2015 report about deferred interest. Um, also. You know, I'm um, really glad, Director Cordray, that this, um, you're sending the letter to the retailers. It's a great use of the bully pulpit um, to, to try to encourage good behavior. Um, however, I ultimately do think the solution to this is deferred interest needs to be banned. Um, deferred interest only exists because it is an exception in Reg Z to the Card Act provisions. The Card Act actually literally prohibits the deferred interest as, as this is constructed right now because the ban on double cycle billing pro prohibits retroactive interest on amounts paid. Um, and so um, that's what happens with this form of deferred interest. And uh, the Fed created an exception in Reg Z for deferred interest to allow it to flourish. And what's even more interesting is before that, they had banned, the Fed had banned deferred interest under its UDAP authority and went through an entire UDAP analysis saying how unfair and abusive this was to consumers. Um, and banned it, but then reversed itself. So historically, there actually has been a finding, this is so bad for consumers, it should be banned. So that's what we ultimately urge. Um, you know, we, we've seen many examples where this trips people up. Um, one of the great statistics from your report is 20% of these folks get socked with retroactive interest, but it's 40% of subprime consumers. So almost half of subprime consumers end up hurt by this, the, the ones probably that can least afford it. Um, and then, you know, in the intersection with electronic statements, you know, do this example, you know, we've, in the um, consumer complaint database, we've seen examples of uh, consumers who have been tripped up with the combination of deferred interest and electronic statements. In general, um, we think 
um, issuers are pushing people too hard into electronic statements with respect to credit cards. They're, you know, late. They're paying late. There's late fees. Our most pop, one of our most popular papers actually is our white paper on why uh, the CFPB should protect consumers' um, right to get paper statements. Um, so, and then payment allocation incredibly confusing. Deferred interest itself is confusing, and then the payment allocation um, is even crazier. So. Oh, and by the way, in terms of personal examples, I don't have one. I haven't been bold enough to try this, but I do have colleagues, okay, colleagues at National Consumer Law Center, okay, who have been tripped up by this. So, you know, e e e even the most sophisticated get tripped up. Thank you. Chris, Kathleen. I had to build in time for the chair switch. Um, <laughs> So just uh, two quick ones, and one, one of my questions was around the, uh, the payment allocations and wondering how it is you could pay 150% of your balance and still get hit with it, and I think that's clear. Um, like, like Judith, I've been up late at night watching, you know, late night TV, and uh, there's also, you know, I see the same thing with furniture companies, except it's like five and six years, and so, um, you know, I, I, I'm pretty confident these are deferred interest because you would want them in this for five years because that's five years of opportunity for them to screw up. Um, I, when I was, when my wife and I first got married, we bought, I think it's the same story all the time. We bought the washer and dryer from Sears. Uh, they had the 0% thing, got the card. Um, nobody said a word about there's a minimum payment that you have to be making in order to, to get that. Um, I read the disclosure and it was buried on page two of the disclosure in in between, I think, the, uh, um, the, the separation clause and the choice of law clause that said you have to continue making a minimum payment, which will be listed on your statement. Um, and so I could easily see how somebody who didn't bother to look at it and thought, well, this is 0% interest would probably miss the first one and then find themselves in a 29% rate uh, going forward. So yeah, I, I think it's incredibly easy to get tripped up by these. Kathleen and Ann. So I think these uh, deferred interest um, arrangements are um, an evidence of, of the way in which complexity creates cross-subsidies. So I think with the exception um, of, of, you know, people who ended up getting caught up in this, those of us who have used products like this are making money on it, right, because we're not paying interest. And what happens is that um, the money that the issuers are making on the people who are less sophisticated um, is more than what they're losing on us. And that's true with lots of things. I know I get at least 250,000 free airline miles a year, right? Somebody is paying for my miles. It costs me about, you know, maybe $300 in, in uh, credit card annual fees, but the miles are worth a whole lot more. So, um, so when this happens, it really is that deferred interest is a subsidy to sophisticated consumers. And I think just from a uh, philosophical standpoint, the CFPB should be doing what it can to minimize or eliminate cross subsidies that arise from complexity and confusion. Thank you, Anne. Just quickly, I had a family member who got trapped in exactly what Chris was mentioning and thought they had this deferred interest time period and ended up getting charged interest immediately and luckily had the money to pay it off and were very disgusted with or disappointed with the transaction. But also just as a basic point, I mean, this seems like the perfect scenario where this product is profitable where people mess up and the profitability is based on people messing up. And that's always a problematic, it's a problematic practice we've seen across a lot of consumer markets and and probably the core reason why this is something that it's great to see the attention being paid on, on this and whether it's the market that will change itself or whether it needs regulation. It, it seems like any product based on that's profitable because people mess up is, is one that, that is concerning. By the way, this is a great example of something I'm sure you all see all the time too. You'll go to buy a product typically at a computer store or something and they'll sell you the product with a $30 rebate but you have to send something in to get the rebate. The only reason to do that is because they know that some portion of you will not send it in and not get the rebate, so it seems like it's 30. I mean, it, I, I, don't, I really don't understand the functionality of that uh, approach to selling a product. I, I really don't quite get it. Joanne, and then Brian will have the last word. Joanne? Yes. Passing, okay, Brian, thanks. I think just about every point I was going to make have been made regarding the subsidies and the and the effect on consumers. The 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 one thing that I could think of is that you 
may need to do more than just ask for sort of voluntary compliance. So just knowing the products, uh, the zero is actually more expensive for the retailers than a, than a pure deferred interest. And for that reason, it may take more than just a, a you know, an ask for sort of voluntary compliance and may have to do more, so. Uh, yes, Rivi. So we were also offered such a thing and like uh, uh, Chi Chi, I was like, I know there's a catch, I know it's gonna mess up and I don't wanna go. But the thing that was interesting that no one has mentioned, cause I qu started quizzing the guy basically wearing my CFPB hat and apparently what happens is if you somehow you do and don't qualify, and this was for Windows, and when you don't qualify, they put you into some, they sent you, and, and the guy very carefully, very nicely explained it to us, and he was very confused by it himself. He's been doing this for a very long time. But they sent you somewhere else, where somehow you ended up with a much higher interest rate, complicated product, that was from what I, you know, what sounded like was actually predatory. So I'm wondering if the if the money that's being made isn't just from the people who the 20 percent who mess up, but the other people who end up in higher cost loans because they didn't qualify for that first for that first product. And I and I don't quite know. And I I you know I sort of wanted to follow up with him and figure it out, but. It's always very mysterious. You know, saying, this is very you know, strange. We say no to people, but then we send them somewhere else, and there they get charged 24.99%. And he was himself mystified by it. So I, I wanted to... So yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know how I would figure out what that, and he, he was he was kind of like, that's not really a great thing that they, you know, but, you know, he was, he had a job, and I would love to figure out uh, how that plays out and whether, how much that is playing out in the, in the appliance store and the washer dryer store and stuff. Great. We have a, a minute or two if you have anything you want to put out here in public session to us in response to what you've heard. Um, I, I'll say something on the complexity point, Wade, I don't know if you want to say something on the second look uh, product issue. Um, another thing that we did in the, in the study, um, we did look to see um, the extent to which consumers learn over time about deferred interest. So we did this at the account level, we tried to work out whether there was a higher payment rate, meaning people successfully paid off a promo during the promo period, if they did that better the second time than the first time or the third time than the second time. And when you first look at that data, you do see that second transactions have a higher payoff rate. But then if you look within that, that is not because people are learning. It is because the population starts to skew towards people who used it successfully the first time. So if you fail, you then tend to drop out of having a second one or a third one, whereas if you succeed, you go on and have more. And so I think one of the more depressing findings uh, in the study was that we didn't see learning about the product. The second scenario you mentioned, I think, is related to uh, a, a so-called second look program. This is where, this is where basically consumer initial. There's a two lenders actually in that space. One has a maybe a, a little tighter underwriting criteria. The second one have a much looser criteria. So that's why you didn't qualify for the first one. You end up sent be sent to the second one. Typically, the second one has much higher rate, like like you mentioned. The first one typically is higher too, you know, in a, in a general retail establishment, roughly 25%. So second tier, definitely much higher than that. So again, if you look at the, the financing nature of this product, it's really help the retailer to make more sales. So this is where <coughs> the more I, I think is better. But it was the same finance company. So that was what was interesting. So it wasn't, so you didn't get sent to a second finance company. You got mm. sent to the same finance company, but it happened. So in one way that the vehicle was, I talked to the sales guy who came to our house, it was Windows. But then the second one was, it was the same company. And so that's why this, you know, he was a sweet old man. And he was saying, this is very strange. You know, when I, tu when I turn, uh, when I take you, this is how it plays out. But when I turn you down, the same company will lend to, will lend to you, but at, at 20, you know, what I don't, and he was sort of, I mean, we qualified and it wasn't an issue at all, 
but you had to kind of, you came to the house and they somehow figured out your credit and they ran it. And you know, there you are, you know, he's given you all the measurements for the windows. You're like, okay, let's go. And then you're like, and we were just going to pay cash. It wasn't an issue, issue for us, but it was a way of like, you, you, you basically, you bought and then you suddenly realize you, you don't qualify for the credit and then you qualify for the predatory credit. I'm so, sorry, sorry yeah, to interrupt. Know, sorry, we are at, at time for our public session. So sorry. I want to thank staff and I want to thank the cab members for great questions, great input to the public. We're breaking until two o'clock. Uh, we'll return at two um, uh, and uh, look forward to seeing you all back then. Thank you.